tonight why we're paying out millions of pounds of public money and asking for virtually nothing in return. What did you get last year? I got £1.3 million. £1.3 million. How money which is meant to help preserve our countryside is being diverted for private profit. Of a system that's broken, a system that's corrupt, a system that's been abused. And, and public money that's going to people who, who frankly don't need it. And those who are getting rich as a result. Do you own a farm? No. I, I'm clearly not rural in any way and, and don't even own a pair of alleys. Tonight, Panorama exposes the money farmers by joining them and we track down the wealthy people being paid large sums of public money. The starkest warning yet of the spending cuts to come. This is the unavoidable budget. Six billion pounds of government spending cuts. Many of us are fighting for our jobs. Benefits are being capped or even cut. But is everyone facing the same hard times? There's one area of public spending which isn't being cut. We spend around three and a half billion pounds a year on farming subsidies. But what are we getting for our money? To answer that question, I traveled to a well-heeled part of Edinburgh. This is Paul Milan. He's a townie through and through, making his money on upmarket property developments like this one, a million pound townhouse. This one will primarily stay as, 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 a, as a dwelling house. So this isn't for you to buy for you? No, 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 this is, a, this is another development investment. Paul's property business is thriving, but he has another sideline going on. It's a very lucrative one. He's found a way to tap into a surprising source of public money. I own a farming subsidy, uh, which I bought in 2006. Um, and uh, on an annual basis claim uh, that farming subsidy. So although it, it seems a little odd, um, officially uh, I'm, I'm legally a farmer as well. Do you own a farm? No. I'm clearly not rural in any way and, and don't even own a pair of wellies. Confused? Well, so was I, but Paul Milan has discovered a loophole in the farming subsidy system. And we'll get to that in a minute, but it basically allows him to get lots and lots of public money, which was meant to go to farmers. You thought, ka-ching, that's yeah. a money opportunity for me. Yeah, absolutely. The policy has allowed me to do it, and I've been smart enough to do it, but it is, it is odd, it is odd, there's no doubt about that. A happy odd. Happy odd. When you get the checks. Yes, absolutely. And the loophole is giving Paul a very good return on his investment. It'll be approximately 2.5 times my initial investment. That's a massive return. It is, huge, huge. Um, with the benefit of hindsight, I would have sold everything I owned, including my own house, uh, to, to invest in, in this type of return. It was over 30% a year. Paul Milan is clearly a man with an eye for a deal. In the past five years, he's doubled his money. So far, he's been paid almost a quarter of a million pounds in public cash. It's effectively an investment guaranteed by the state. If he'd put his money in government bonds, he'd have been lucky to get a return of 4 or 5% a year. Now, if what Paul is saying is right, then it sounds like money for doing absolutely nothing. And to a hard-working person like me, that seems like a pretty good deal. And theoretically, if he can do it, then I can too. But first, how does the loophole itself actually work? Well, farmers get financial support in the form of a government subsidy payment for every hectare of land that they have. So, in this example, our farmer has 10 hectares each worth £100 in subsidy. 10 times 100, that's £1,000 a year from the government. Well, us, it's public money after all. Now, he can sell the right or the entitlement to claim that money to anyone he likes. So an investor, like Paul Milan, buys it from the farmer. The farmer walks away with a one-off lump sum in his pocket. Now, all the investor needs to do is rent 10 hectares of any old land. 
and now the government pays the investor the £1,000 every year. He doesn't even have to farm. His only obligation is to keep the land in good condition, which for the barren ground rented by investors means just leaving it alone. But this isn't what the farming subsidy system was meant to be used for. Its roots lie in the end of the Second World War. Among the workers are harrow boys who put in a useful weekend weeding and hoeing. There was a fear that Europe might not be able to feed itself. That led to a system where farmers get public support from European bodies. And that's now administered through the European Common Agricultural Policy. But our investigation suggests it isn't all going where it should. You can get quite small farmers, or even non-farmers, who buy these entitlements and rent land that produces very, very little and gain, on, gain all the subsidy. Uh, and that's, a, to my mind, a, a startling abuse of the system. We can reveal for the first time the full extent of the abuse of the subsidy system. Different rules apply to different parts of the UK, but we've discovered the Scottish government is paying out huge sums of money to people who aren't actively farming the land. Their own estimate, prepared for us, is that that figure could be anywhere between three and 30 million pounds a year. But how easy would it be for anyone, including me, to get their hands on some of that cash? First, I had to register myself as a farmer. There wasn't a test. I didn't need any land. I just had to fill in a simple form. What's just arrived is what I've been waiting for. It's a letter from the Scottish Government uh, to say that uh, my business, Sam's Farming, is now official, which basically means that as of now, I am a farmer. So step one of exploiting the loophole completed. Step two is to buy the right to claim the subsidy. Right, moving on to next lot, lot 11, that's ours. Oh, fingers crossed. No bids yet. It's all very civilised sitting here doing it this way. I quite like being a farmer. On this live auction website, farmers owning subsidy entitlements can sell them to other farmers or investors like me. Oh, we're winning. I'm winning. I am the current buyer of these entitlements. Sold to remote buyer. That's me, I think. Transaction successful. I have just bought my first entitlements. Fantastic. All I have to do now is attach that entitlement to a piece of empty land, do nothing, and the government would pay me as a farmer. So now I've got a whole new life ahead of me, a lady of leisure. I might get myself just one cow to keep me company, but no muddy farms for me. That might seem like a dream, but others are using the loophole to generate serious money. I'm in the middle of a field in Sutherland, and the reason why is because Balnacoyle Estate is just a few miles over those hills. Now, last year, that estate attracted almost half a million pounds in public subsidies. <laughs> We've spoken to local farmers and checked with experts, and no one thinks there's a farming business here. So we're going to have a little look at Balna Coil. Our suspicion is that they're using their empty land, or naked acres as they're called, to exploit the same loophole as Palmer land, but on a much bigger scale. Now look, we're not blind blind here. We know that Balna Coil Estates has been buying up lots of subsidy entitlements. And you just need to look around this area to see that they've got a ready supply of naked acres. Just look at it. Incredible. Balna Coil isn't a farm. It's a sporting estate where the owners or their guests can fish for salmon or shoot wild deer. Our research shows that after this estate was purchased for three and a half million pounds, the Danish owner bought entitlements worth nearly half a million which means that a foreign multimillionaire is being paid this country's public money. But for what? 
Well, I've seen uh, a couple of lochs and uh, deer, but not much farming. In fact, I haven't seen any farming yet. I'm looking. I'm looking hard, but nothing. Actually, there's some sheep. I think that counts as farming. We've found no evidence of a significant farming business here, certainly not one which might justify a payout on the scale the estate is getting. The owner is Peter Neeson. He made his money selling outsized clothing for the larger customer in Scandinavia. We put our findings to him of the fact he claims almost half a million pounds a year, despite doing no significant farming, but he refused to answer any of our questions. It's scandalous. I mean, I think that is a very good example of a system that's broken, a system that's corrupt, a system that's been abused, and, and public money that's going to people who, who frankly don't need it. I arranged to meet up with one of the people whom Andy Whiteman feels is getting public money they don't need. Stephen Strathdee is one of Britain's biggest recipients of farming subsidy. I mean, just sitting here alone is how much? <laughs> well, it's over a million pounds. Yeah, well over a million. So you and can, the combines? The combines there are 200 odd thousand each plus, uh, and then with a lot of machines as well. He and his wife Frida own 39 farms. You must be worth quite a lot of money. Okay. <laughs> Not complaining. Seriously, though, you, you, you must have a few, a few pounds in the pocket. All right. Well, worth about 50 million, net wealth. 50 million pounds by anybody's standards is a large sum of money. Stephen Strathdee isn't someone who seems in desperate need of public cash, yet that's exactly what he's getting. In terms of a farming subsidy, how much do you get? What did you get last year? I get 1.3 million pounds. 1.3 million. Yes. I That's a lot. I just think people would say, do you actually need public money to fund a business and your worth, which is tens of millions? Do you need that public money? Yes, we need to do the farming unless we wouldn't have producing the food. We couldn't have done it without it. And uh, it went pointless to do it. Uh, if you, you wouldn't have made no profit. You would, it would be a big loss you would have. like. Stephen wanted us to see his active farm business, but he's also a major trader in entitlements. He spent around three million pounds buying them up and attaching them to empty land. In return for that investment, he's getting back millions more in public money. But what does the taxpayer get in return? It's not only me it benefits. Them, the farmers who sell entitlements benefit. They pay tax on the sale of entitlements, huge tax bills. The, the, the money that I borrow, the bank gets profit of it, uh, it keeps people on work. But how does Stephen Strathdee defend himself from critics who say the system shouldn't be paying him for using the loophole? That's a system, and uh, that's what's in place just now, we stay within the rules. And if they want to change it, I'll look at the new rules and look how we, we work in the future. So Stephen Strathdee says he just does what the rules allow him to do. After all, he's a businessman. He'll invest in anything which works. Forestry, wind farms, developing houses. The subsidy loophole is no different. And the profits go back into his business. But where there are winners, there are losers too. In much of the UK, the system actively discriminates against the people who need help the most. People like 28-year-old Mark Jones, whom I met while he was helping out on his father's farm in Powys. Uh, beautiful view out there. You know, you can't really beat uh, this kind of farming, can you? It's, um, it's, once it's in your blood, um, you just want to carry on. But for a young farmer like Mark, the system, which allows those with deep pockets to benefit from subsidy entitlements, actually acts against him. As well as finding the capital to buy livestock and rent land, he also needs to find the money to buy the subsidy entitlement at a time when banks aren't lending. Why would you have to buy the entitlements? Presumably that should come with whatever farm or, or land that you have. 
No, no, it doesn't. The entitlement system was originally set up uh, on a traditional basis. So what farmers were getting 10 years ago is basically how they, they've set it up now. So anyone new coming into the industry has to actually go out and, and buy entitlements, which is a bit of an issue for young people coming in to start with. How on earth would, I mean, on top of everything else you have to be able to afford, you then have to afford that? Yeah. And uh, that, that's the biggest problem, really. Without single farm payments and, and the entitlements, um, farmers doesn't make any money at all. So Mark is stuck helping out his dad, despite being desperate to start his own farm. That's because the payments farmers get today are based on activity 10 years ago. New farmers coming onto the ground either have to buy the right to claim subsidy or do without. The people selling that right are often retired or renting out their farmland to someone else. It's another case of money going to people who aren't actually farming. Mark arranged for me to meet a couple of other young farmers in his local. I wondered whether they'd resent those who were able to claim without working the land. You can see it in a way as being very shrewd business men or women who have actually worked the system. And there's, there's nothing wrong with, with that really, but what does frustrate you is seeing the, the amount of money they're receiving for actually, they're play, playing the game, if you like. It's yeah. the system that is wrong. So is it a little bit of envy as well then? Of course it is. There's, there's an element of there, there because you know it frustrates you that you can't go to that level because you haven't got the financial backing to be able to do it as, as the way, way things are really. The problems we've seen so far are largely down to the trade in subsidy. But the common agricultural policy means there are also some recipients that might seem a bit odd. For example, Manchester Airport gets subsidy because there are tenant farmers on some of its land. Some of our poshest schools like Eton get subsidy for environmental improvements. Christchurch College Oxford gets payment because they graze cattle on water meadows that they own. There's even subsidy that goes to the estates of dead people, and some golf courses claim cash as well. But there's a more fundamental issue here. The Common Agricultural Policy pays people a flat rate for every hectare of land that they own. When it comes to subsidies paid to landowners, unlike benefits, there's no upper limit on payments or even means testing, which makes those with the biggest land holdings the real winners. They're almost all active farmers, but you might be surprised to hear some of those whom we, the public, are supporting financially. The search for them brought me here to central London. Subsidy campaigner Jack Thurston agreed to accompany me on a tour, which went in search of some of the people who are, perfectly legally, pulling down six-figure sums. Now over my left shoulder is London's Ritz Hotel. We're not too far from Park Lane. That's home to someone who invariably pops up every now and again on Britain's rich list. It's Sir Richard Sutton. Last year, he got £1.9 million in farming subsidies over 10 years. That's £13 million of public money. Sir Richard Sutton is a baronet with extensive property holdings. Now, you might not have heard of him, but you will have heard of this man, the Duke of Westminster, reportedly worth £7 billion, which makes him the richest Briton alive. This is Grosvenor Street, and it's home to the business enterprises of one Major General, Gerald Cavendish Grosvenor. That's the Duke of Westminster to you and I. Now, in the last 10 years, the Duke of Westminster has earned around £6 million in farming subsidies alone. And you may be surprised to hear that Her Majesty the Queen is also a significant recipient of subsidies. Now, in the last 10 years, she's received around £7 million in farming subsidies. We ran all these numbers, which have been taken from government records, past the Queen, the Duke of Westminster and Sir Richard Sutton. None of them wanted to be interviewed or comment on the figures, but a Buckingham Palace spokesperson said, like others with agricultural interests, we are in receipt of the single farm payment. When you look at the people we, we looked at, the Queen, the Duke of Westminster, Sir Richard Sutton, these don't strike me as people who are in particular need of public money. You're absolutely right. These are very wealthy people, and if we're in the business of handing out public money to farmers because they're poor, 
these are not the kind of people that we'd be handing that money to. Because we're talking millions. I mean, it's a lot of money and it's public money. It's an awful lot of money. And the reason they get so much is because they own so much land. And the farm subsidies are allocated on the basis of how much land you've got, not how much financial need you're in. Panorama can reveal for the first time the true extent of large payments across the UK. We've established that for the last year available, 2010, almost 900 recipients were paid over a quarter of a million pounds. Of them, 133 got over half a million, and 47 were paid over a million pounds. But European privacy rules mean that we have no right to know who these people even are. In fact, the published information only names about a quarter of recipients. Why do you think there is such a lack of transparency? I think it's much easier for governments and bureaucrats to keep things secret because it reduces the amount of public scrutiny on a policy that is very hard to justify when everything's out in the open. But that doesn't seem fair because what it seems to mean is that the kind of elite few, the wealthy landowners of this country, get a huge amount of money but we don't actually have to be told clearly what they get. Well, it's not fair, and this kind of information should be made public. So, how would the organisation representing farmers defend the payments made by the Common Agricultural Policy, also known as the CAP? The Queen, the Duke of Westminster, Sir Richard Sutton. Do these people really need our money? But the Public financial support. Look, we could have a very long debate about CAP and how Well, it's a simple yes or no, quite frankly. Do these people need the financial support in terms of public money that they're getting? Your average farmer desperately needs that money. And they're the not your average farmer. My point is, if you give me time to explain, is we've moved from supporting cows and sheep or a tonne of wheat to paying it on a land area. Why do we make that change? Because when you subsidise a, a, a sheep, the more you kept, kept, the more you got. When we subsidise a cow, the more cows you kept, the more support you got. We've rightly moved from having a system that developed grain mountains and milk lakes, etc., to one that we paid on land and demanded people looked at it in good condition. One of the anomalies of that is some people who have very large land holdings and therefore don't do much with it, receive some support. I'll ask the question again because I feel you haven't answered it. Okay. Do these people deserve the financial support they're getting in terms of the public money? Do they need the money? Um, they are competing. I, I think far, this is an agricultural policy, not an income policy. What we're saying is producing food receives some level of compensation from taxpayers. So look, I don't think it's a great PR story for farming that someone might receive a million pounds or two million pounds. Of course I don't. I would be naive to think it is. But it's one of those side effects of the system we have at present. I want money to go to active farmers who are producing food. And that shouldn't matter whether you're producing it on two acres or 2,000 acres. With the current system that we have with CAP, it's unavoidable. So the NFU argues the European system makes these big payments unavoidable. And that system is under review with a new regime due in the next two years. The man leading that process is determined that the big sums handed out to UK landowners will soon be a thing of the past. He proposes to cap payments at €300,000 a year, about £250,000. I am very frustrated because these millions of uh, very honest farmers have to suffer because uh, some speculators who use this uh, opportunity with common agricultural policy to become uh, more, rich on, more rich only because they have some uh, hectares. So this why for me this capping and this definition of active farmer are two main elements of the next uh, reform and I really hope that uh, taxpayers in uh, uh, UK and in uh, all around the European Union will support uh, this proposal of European uh, Commission to obtain this more transparent, more targeted and more fair utilisation of uh, use of common agricultural policy. In the UK, the Scottish and Welsh administrations are willing to consider a cap. 
and Northern Ireland wants one set at just €100,000. But England's administration, DEFRA, is totally opposed to one. We wanted to ask DEFRA why, but they declined an interview, instead issuing this statement. Successive UK governments have been opposed to capping payments. This is because, to avoid losing subsidies, bigger farms would restructure and the only gainers would be lawyers. Capping would also damage charities like the National Trust, which own large areas of land and protect wildlife and rural areas. I think it's not a strong and good argument because if a business in agriculture is linked only to the subsidies, it's not a real business and an efficient business. We have to ask to these people to, re to reorient this uh, activity on another uh, direction and to be more efficient. Back in Scotland, it was time to wrap up my business decision to use the trading loophole. Although I may not be an actual working farmer, I thought I might as well travel like one. Do you know, everybody I've met has been telling me the same thing. It's not me, it's the system. What I'm doing is legal, it's the system. So I'm off to meet the man who's in charge of the system. I decided to take the opportunity to meet up with my farming colleagues at the union's AGM, where I'd have the chance to meet the man in charge of Scotland's subsidy system. Good morning. What a great pleasure it is to be with you all again once more at your AGM here in St Andrews. It's always real nice to spend St Valentine's Day with your loved ones. <laughs> Ultimately, he's the man responsible for the loophole, which I've used to register as a farmer. I really, really am very frustrated by the serious flaw we have at the moment in the common agricultural policy. I'm in the, the position, the ludicrous position, where I am unable to support, under European legislation, farmers, new entrants perhaps, young farmers who want a future in agriculture, to help them produce. But we are paying out to some people who are not active. Like and that's me. why we have to fix like that. Like me. I'm a registered farmer now, apparently. There's my farm. I'm registered. And he is the receipt of the entitlements which I've bought. I've got no intention of farming. I'm not interested. Yeah. But this is what your system allows. It's Europe's system. We're trying to change the legislation. This is exactly how it can be abused. And this is why I put so much effort into trying to persuade Europe to change the legislation with some success because we're actually going to get into the new common agricultural policy, what's called the Scottish Clause, but this which has means been that we will not allow people to take enough. advantage of this loophole. Would you accept it's been going on for long enough? This has been going on for far too long and this is why I've sat down face to face with European officials and said to them, can you help us fix this loophole? The European Commission said member states should have closed the loophole using rules introduced two years ago, but the Scottish government said those measures would have penalised genuine farmers. Whoever's responsible, my experience of registering as a farmer was that it was easy. Why should people care about this? Because it's their money. I mean, this is public money. And uh, particularly in a time of cuts and austerity, we need to make sure that every penny of public money is spent as efficiently as possible. And at the moment, millions are going to people to do nothing. Farming subsidies are here to stay, but the whole system will be revised in the next two years. Only then will we know if the loopholes and alleged inequalities will be resolved. More empire building next on BBC One. Jeremy Paxman discovers the British way of doing things. While on BBC Three they witnessed riots and revolutions, young Arabs give their account of the Arab Spring. And tomorrow morning, Labour leader Ed Miliband will be taking your calls from 11.15 on Radio 5 Live. <laughs>